nothing would ever be the same again. Nothing could ever be the same again. Ten sixty six remains the most familiar date in English history. The events of that day and the story leading up to it told in a unique fashion. This is a propagandist account without equal. But for the victors of ten sixty six, the story doesn't end there. A new military force had burst on the European scene. There would be other brilliant campaigns, other glorious conquests. These people would profoundly affect the history of Europe, and yet the most puzzling part of their story is the way they disappeared from all their conquered lands. Hastings was a very long battle indeed, probably one of the longest medieval battles of all time. The 1066 battle was regarded throughout Europe with horror for the extent of the slaughter. Most of the British aristocracy and the noble families were slaughtered, or they uh, were imprisoned and then put to death, or they ran away to Istanbul. Uh, and what was left was a country under subjugation by an extraordinary ferocious warlord. William was a consummate general. He was able to mix cold caution with bold decision, and I think that really sums up the man. They took the line, and uh, propagandists developed this line, uh, that England was backward, backward-looking. It was a country where things were done in Anglo-Saxon, where there were saints who had not been heard of in Europe, where the buildings were, uh, seemed to be primitive and so forth. So they saw England, in some respects, if you like, as a third-world country, and they were its saviours. The mighty Charlemagne was dead. The Carolingian Empire he had dominated, disintegrating. And as the Carolingian Empire broke up, so Europe was left in chaos. Since there was no one person considered fit enough to rule this vast old empire, it was divided between his three grandsons. The Western Kingdom ruled by the recognised King of France, but the land in his direct possession was reduced to this. And yet he was the King of France and overlord of all those dynasties that had sprouted up. Feudalism, especially in France, was being ordered. The king was its head. Here at Carnarvon, over a millennium later, feudalism was proudly put on display. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. An ancient ceremony had been reenacted to the delight of all but a few protesters. The prince had sworn to his monarch a solemn oath of loyalty and military support. In medieval Europe, such oaths meant something. Monarchy was vested with an awesome power, semi-divine. The land was gifted by God. 
The King of France, though limited territorially, was supreme in authority over this land. Such conventions mattered nothing to the pagan people of the north, Scandinavia, the homeland of the Normans. For centuries, their war bands had harassed the coastline of northern and western Europe. Men of the open sea, expert mariners, frightening enemies. In a decimated empire, no one could effectively resist them. From the wrath of the Vikings, good Lord deliver us, was a common enough prayer. The monasteries were particularly helpless. Exposed in the open sea, Mont Saint-Michel was perpetually ravaged. But even well inland, Jumierge near Rouen was ceaselessly attacked. In the end, the monks gathered their few remaining treasures and fled, leaving the once proud monastery to decay and ruin. The Norwegian leader Rollo was the prime invader in these parts. A giant of a man, fearless and intensely cruel. He is widely recognized as the founder figure of the Norman people. With Paris within his sights, the King of France would have to deal with him. Military force was no option, and so in 911, a simple deal was struck. Rollo and his followers would be given the lands of Normandy on condition that they would defend them from other would-be invaders and Rollo, in turn, would acknowledge the king as his overlord and swear the usual oath of fealty to him. One other thing, the pagan Rollo must convert to Christianity. For the Normans, no problem, and at Rouen Cathedral, with great solemnity, the Viking chief was baptized in the new faith. He celebrated his baptism in his own peculiar way, the slaughter of a few hundred prisoners. His remains were eventually interred in Rouen Cathedral, the acknowledged founder of an amazing people whose story had but begun. Rollo and his descendants were terrible Christians, but they were good churchmen. Straight away, they set about to restore the monasteries to even greater grandeur than before. St. Michael, the sword-bearing angel, soon became their patron saint. No effort or expense was spared in the reconstruction of the monastery dedicated to him. But, as so often in the Norman story, Behind the open show of good works lurked ulterior political motives. Gradually, the, uh, the leaders of Rouen, Rollo and his son and his grandson, begin to give back the lands that had been taken from the, from the monasteries. And by doing so, the, um, the dynasty of, of Rollo um, allied themselves with the church received the favor of the church and this was absolutely essential because of course the abbots and the um, the bishops came from the indigenous aristocracy and it is only with the help of the aristocracy that ultimately Rollo was able to uh, establish himself so uh, support from the church was absolutely uh, essential. 
The works of Norman chroniclers are dominated by two themes, benefactions to the church and warfare. To many, contradictory themes, but in the Normans' mindset, there were no contradictions. From their Scandinavian beginnings, they glorified in their military prowess. It was a necessity to spend freely on all the up-to-date armaments of war, the chainmail, the metal helmet, the steel sword. And in particular, their horses, on which they spent a fortune. They knew that strong military bases would be needed to control their new gotten lands. The now famous Motten Bailey castles were ideal. Erected simply of earth and timber, they could be put up quickly. These simple constructions fulfilled several functions. Refuges if attacked, bases for attack, and ideal administrative centres to control the indigenous population. As a new millennium approached, so Europe felt a strange religious awakening. Corruption amongst monks and bishops had become endemic. The papacy, a scandalous disgrace. Early voices for reform were first raised in the monasteries of France, Norman ones amongst them. Beck, once ravaged by the Norsemen, was now elevated by their descendants who added fuel to its reforming zeal. Cleansed of sleaze and corruption, the monasteries were like magnets to the profound religious thinkers of Europe. To Beck came Lanfranc, an Italian-born reformer and outstanding teacher. With ready support from the Norman rulers, he transformed this little-known, ill-kept institution to one of Europe's greatest scholastic centres. Many of his best-known works are reverently preserved in the monastic library of today. But now, it is only the dedicated few who pore over his teachings. Yet in his lifetime, Beck attracted pupils from all over Europe. The most notable amongst them, another Italian, Anselm of Lucca. In time, he would occupy St. Peter's seat and be hailed as one of the greatest reforming popes. His writings were absorbed and analysed throughout the Christian world. In pre-university days, the monasteries were the intellectual powerhouses. Beck stood comparison with the best of them. Normandy by now had been transformed. No longer the land of the barbarian marauders, this was a land where conspicuous wealth was placed at the disposal of theologians, the church, the arts and culture. Within a century of Rollo, the Normans no longer looked or sounded like Northmen. They had given up piracy and paganism to become Christian. They no longer spoke a Scandinavian language, but French. They were becoming French. Chroniclers forged myths about their distant past for a reason. It was the creation of these myths that created a nation, a nation favoured always by the Almighty. They would then be granted their greatest leader, although the start of his life was very inauspicious. Resident in Falaise, the current Duke Robert could not resist the lure of the local tanner's daughter. She bore him a bastard son, William. Robert died on return from pilgrimage to the Holy Land. 
His son William was but seven years of age. Guarded by his father's allies and his mother's family, the numerous plots on his young life were somehow thwarted. Throughout his early years, various plotters voiced their opposition to his right of inheritance. The greatest problem William faced was the fact that he was illegitimate. His um, mother was his father's concubine, so they were not uh, married. Um, this was a reason taken by um, his uncles in particular as the greatest obstacle to him becoming a uh, duke. And um, fortunately, especially as a result of the uh, support given by his mother's family, the uncles on his father's side never got um, anywhere near their, their goal to ousting uh, him. With a grim determination far beyond his years, he set about overcoming all the problems. Thoroughly trained to wield the sword and to master the techniques of cavalry warfare, he became one of the greatest military leaders of medieval Europe. He needed to be. Powerful dynasties were sniping at Normandy's borders, and within those borders, powerful barons were causing mayhem. Aged 18, he commanded his own army for the first time, here at Valais d'Un. With the support of the King of France, he turned on the rebellious barons and crushed them. William's biographer describes how the king and the duke, unafraid of the strength of their enemies, inflicted a great slaughter on their foes. The young William was already showing a cruel streak Rollo would have been proud of. A series of battles followed. In all of them, William emerged the victor. In the eyes of his followers, he was invincible. Developing new strategies of warfare, he would feign defeat, and then, when they least expected it, attack the relaxing opponents and crush them. Month by month, he secured the borders of Normandy from all would-be aggressors, which included his one-time ally, the King of France. But the duchy could well have disintegrated from internal pressure. Con Castle typified William's resolve to bring the duchy to heel. It was a power centre. It was a statement of power. Invincible on the battlefield, unmatched in his military strategy, Mother Luck would now be kind to him in another way. His wife, Matilda. William chose his bride well, a beautiful young lady and daughter of the powerful Count of Flanders. But there was a snag. The church had developed tough laws determining who could marry who within the same family. Cousins William and Matilda were too closely related, said the codified list. So said the Pope. But Rome was placated when William built in Caen two great religious houses. The one, a magnificent monastery. And for Matilda, who had always wanted to go into holy service, an equally splendid nunnery. At the time, nothing could have been further from his mind. But his wife, Matilda, would become a nun and choose to end her days here. The church, built by her husband, became her burial place.
Guillaume le Conquérant est bien sûr un, un grand guerrier, ça va de soi, parce que sinon il n'aurait pas gagné la bataille d'Hastings. C'est un chef très fort euh, qui sait pratiquer la violence, ça, on peut le constater souvent sur les champs de bataille, mais euh, c'est aussi quelqu'un qui a une vision politique très importante. Si on prend l'exemple de la ville de Caen, euh, qu'il a pratiquement créé ex nihilo, il s'est appuyé euh, sur plusieurs petits villages qu'il a regroupés avec le château, les deux abbayes. C'est vraiment déjà une vision stratégique, urbanistique d'une ville. A fundamental part of Norman's strategy was always territorial expansion. In William's case, England beckoned. An Anglo-Saxon country with a population of about two million, half of them little better than slaves. Living simple rural lives, the raw material of other people's history. Those other people, the aristocrats, had developed an effective administrative machine to run the country and imposed a lucrative tax structure. The land tax, or geld, had made this kingdom one of the richest in Europe. This was the plum dangled before William, a rich, ordered kingdom four or five times greater than the Duchy of Normandy. How could he resist? What attracted William to England was the same what had attracted generations of Scandinavians to England. Um, as a result of the very efficient system of administration, any king of England could uh, collect the maximum of, of taxation that was due to, uh, to him in, uh, in a very efficient um, manner. And uh, no other country in Western Europe had such an efficient uh, system. So if we say that William was attracted to the throne, it wasn't so much the, the, the title of king as well, the, the, the means by which he could lay his hands on the, um, the, the cash. Anglo-Saxon England faced a succession crisis. Although, according to the Bayer account of things, the throne had clearly been promised to William. Indeed, he did have a good claim to it. He was the reigning King Edward the Confessor's closest relative, his cousin. But there was no easy way to gain the throne. There were other claimants, all of them, like William himself, of Viking origins, all of them determined to capture the kingdom. 1066 had started for the dying Edward with the completion of his pet project, Westminster Abbey. Splendidly designed by Norman architects, little did the saintly Edward know that the only service he would take part in here would be his own funeral. Before the end of January, he was dead. The line of Anglo-Saxon kings was dead with him. Edward's body barely cold, his brother-in-law Harold Godwinson hurriedly arranged a coronation service in the abbey, his own. He was crowned Harold II, King of England. And there were plenty in the abbey to support him, all the Anglo-Danish aristocracy allied to his side. But Harold's hijacking of the throne stirred the rivals into action. William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, foremost among them. According to him, Harold had sworn a devout vow of loyalty, supporting his claim to the throne. What had happened was sacrilege, and William promptly made a successful appeal for papal support. The nightly appearance of Halley's Comet for a week augured ill for Harold. William's call to arms augured even worse. An army of 7,000 men 
congregated at the port of Dives sur mer near Caen. Not all of them were Norman. About a fifth of them came from the adjoining provinces, Brittany, Flanders, Artois and Picardy. The whole campaign was meticulously planned. A fleet of up to 700 vessels specially constructed. But even with everything in place, William would not rush. Bad weather and reports from his English spies bade caution. He was well advised, as across the North Sea came one of the most colourful claimants for the throne, the mighty King of Norway, Harald Hadrada, a giant of a man. He had torn a lion apart with his bare hands. He would tear apart Harold Godwinson too. Despite the imminent threat of William in the south, Hadrada had to be faced now. The two forces met at Stamford Bridge in Yorkshire. Hard to believe today that anything untoward ever happened here on the banks of the Derwent River. But on the 25th of September, 1066, it was the scene of a bloody massacre. Hadrada took an arrow full in the throat. Leaderless, his Viking army was hacked to pieces. It took just 24 of the Norwegian fleet of 300 ships to ferry the pitiful remnants home. William, meanwhile, settled for patience and continual pep talks to the troops. Then, on the evening of Thursday, September the 28th, he set sail. No armada like it had ever been seen before. 7,000 men, 6,000 horses, three for each night. William's own ship led the way on a nighttime crossing, arriving with the morning at Pevensey Bay. The troops on disembarking gave their thanks to the Almighty and settled to a party of great rejoicing. Partying over, William then terrorized the surrounding area with a medieval version of shock and awe. As always, the first casualties, the innocent a mother and son in flight. Harold and his army, barely recovered from their efforts at Stamford Bridge, now faced a 250-mile trek southward. They covered it in just 12 days. Facing them, one of the most powerful war machines in Europe, the Norman army of foot soldiers, archers and cavalry. No ordinary horses these, known as destriers, each had unique features. It needed to be strong enough to take an armoured warrior at the gallop. It needed to be high enough such that uh, it could dominate uh, opposing infantry. It needed to be steady enough so that it was not going to be upset by the noise of battle. It needed to be brave enough such that it could take wounds and still continue to fight and it needed to be aggressive enough such that it could not only uh, kick and bite, um, but in fact take an aggressive part in the battle itself. 9 a.m., Saturday, October the 14th, at Battle Hill near Hastings, the two forces clash. Flaunting the papal banner of support, William advanced slowly, followed by his cavalry. Harold's exhausted troops, arriving by foot, form a shield wall. Employing their archers, the Normans take the initiative. One of the biggest battles in medieval history had begun. The Norman cavalry charge, but they are not effective. The slope of Battle Hill makes it difficult even for their horses. Right from the start, William's troops have a hard time of it. The Normans may well have the best cavalry in Europe, but Harold's troops have their own potent war weapon. 
This two-handed battle axe was the weapon par excellence of the uh, English house cars. One of these axes actually brought down not only the knight, but the horse with one single blow. It really was a devastating weapon. On the battlefield, confusion. Rumours run rife that William has been killed. The first phase is an undisputed English triumph. The Normans, dispirited, are close to defeat. Then, out of the melee, William remounts his charge and rallies his forces, screaming, with God's help, we shall win. In Norman eyes, he was indeed invincible. Bolstered by this newfound confidence, the Normans charge again and again and again. Three times the Duke felt his horse die under him. Three times he finds a new mount. He knows they are all similarly harnessed and saddled. If we look at the saddles, we can see that they have got tremendously deep saddles. And the reason for this is that they cannot be pushed out of the saddle easily uh, with the bit at the front and the bit at the back to maintain their position snugly upon the horse. Again, one of the features on the tapestry are the very, very long stirrups. And these stirrups, of course, are long such that the warrior can actually literally stand up and he's got a very good base for a sword slash or for a lance thrust. The Norman knights are actually using three different techniques with the lance. One is the overarm stabbing motion. The other is an underarm, which is very good against motionless uh, infantry. And then, of course, the couch lance, where it's tucked neatly under the arm like so. And this was a technique that was actually developed in the 11th century for really unhorsing mounted opponents. The battle is proving to be the biggest and the longest in England's history. The huge advantage of the Norman cavalry was being whittled away. The day was England's for the taking. Until, that is, William resorted to an old strategy of the feigned retreat. He ordered his troops and cavalry to turn in apparent flight. It wasn't something that just pulled out of the air, it was a tactic that they had used before. And it meant that, the, uh, that William uh, had ordered his knights and his uh, infantry, probably supported with archers as well, to actually charge up to the positions of, uh, of the English turn around as if they're fleeing, and therefore draw the English out of their positions, who thought, of course, they'd won the day. And then when they came down into the valley, the Normans were to turn around and cut them down. Seeing victory in their grasp, over a thousand of the English broke ranks in pursuit of the retreating Normans. A fatal error. On William's command, the Norman cavalry encircled the broken English defences and massacred them. After over eight hours on the battlefield, the English saw victory snatched away. We've all grown up in the belief that this part of the tapestry correctly shows Harold fatefully wounded from an arrow in the eye. Some recent historians now query this. This is not Harold, they say. The true depiction of him is the figure being disemboweled by a Norman knight. The truth is elusive. Harold's death, fact. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, this was a day of destiny for England. A fatal disaster for our dear country. Harold was dead. England had a new king, a new future. William had sworn that should God grant him victory, then he would build a great abbey in thanksgiving on the exact spot of Harold's death. The grave is here. The abbey is here, built in pious jubilation that God from the days of Rollo has always sided with his servants, the Normans.
On Christmas Day 1066, Westminster Abbey was abuzz with the coronation of William, the new King of England. Outside, Norman troops were posted to keep order, just in case. The atmosphere was tense. Inside, the church was packed with English and Norman dignitaries. The ceremony was conducted in English and French, and with William seated on the throne, there were shouts of acclamation as the crown was placed on his head. Outside, the tetchy Norman troops thought that it was the English shouting their disapproval of their beloved Duke, who was visibly nervous and not a little unsure. To add further confusion, smoke from an accidental fire outside began to drift into the abbey. The fire got out of hand, the smoke got thicker, and those inside rushed out in fear of their lives. The whole ceremony was reduced to bedlam and chaos, with only a handful of bishops and priests remaining to bring the service to a rushed end. Hardly a distinctive start to the foreigner's reign as King of England. England, meanwhile, was left to reflect on the abrupt end of one era and the ominous dawn of another. At Hastings, the flower of English youth and nobility had littered the ground far and wide. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle relates, England now is the habitation of foreigners. Norman victory at Hastings was converted to conquest with amazing alacrity. William built over 500 Motton Bailey castles in the first 20 years of his reign. He just as quickly converted many of the key ones into more imposing stone structures like Dover. From here, he literally terrorized the surrounding countryside to Norman subjection. Villages were destroyed, the inhabitants butchered, just to serve as examples to their neighbors. To secure the capital, construction was started on the infamous Tower of London. The newcomers, wrote an Anglo-Saxon chronicler, devour the riches and entrails of England, and there is no hope of the misery coming to an end. The new reign brought in other changes as well. The Norman Conquest changed the mindset of the uh, people of the, the British uh, Isles in that um, whereas the people of Britain um, had been um, experiencing themselves as a northern people, people with an affinity to those of uh, Denmark and, and, and Norway, uh, after the Norman Conquest, they um, are forced to look southwards to, to London, the southeast of England, uh, Normandy, of course, and uh, further south into, uh, into France. The imposing battlements of the Rochester Castle we see today are the fruits of several generations of builders, but it was started by William as part of his reign of terror. The southeast was key to him. Centres like Rochester made it clear to all that resistance would not be tolerated. The north of England remained with their eyes across the North Sea. They had yet to come to terms with the new foreign rulers, and when William first travelled there in 1068, there was little resistance to him. Then the following January, the cries of rebellion were heard. Northern magnates took action and massacred the Norman troops stationed at Durham. William's response was savage. He and his knights systematically destroyed the opposition. Houses were burnt all food and stock commandeered. The land laid waste. The result, a catastrophic famine in which the bulk of the population of Yorkshire either starved, died 
or fled the land. The Anglo-Saxon aristocracy had been brought to heel in the most despicable episode of William's reign. York was decimated, but the church, the center of the North's religious framework, was saved. Still, with religious institutions like York holding over a sixth of the nation's wealth, it could not be ignored. William's answer was breathtakingly simple. He brought in Norman priests. At York, the sea was conveniently vacant. William filled the post by appointing a canon from Bayer as its new archbishop, an omen of what was to come. His harrying of the north was yet again proving the old dictum that the Normans were appalling Christians, but good churchmen. Durham proved just how good. William lavished his new gained wealth on castles and churches, bringing in Norman architects. These were men with exciting, thrilling designs, state-of-the-art designs. Down came the old, simple Anglo-Saxon churches. Norman buildings replaced them. The number of major churches built before 1100 is indeed staggering. They remain the greatest living testaments of William's reign. Dispossession and destruction of the pre-conquest power structure in church and state was now the policy. Hastings meant that William now owned England, every inch of it. He parceled it out to his own Norman allies, who had been straining to be rewarded for their support. Within 20 years, they divided up virtually all the land in England between themselves. To keep order on matters, William announced that he wanted to know what had happened to every single piece of land in the kingdom. The result? Doomsday Book. On the one hand, boring administrative accounts. To the medieval historian, they're a treasure house. Every landowner is listed. The change of ownership, staggering. By now, only two of the king's tenants-in-chief were still English. England was totally taken over by these newcomers. When uh, William commanded that all of England be surveyed for the two doomsday books to see what was happening, some man wrote, not a cow, not a pig was left out in the whole land. They wanted to know everything that was there, because it was theirs now. It was like counting the property, what was on the estate. England was the new estate. It was a place where they could settle and have lands. He could reward his followers. There's no question that it was a land completely subjugated, and it was only by a later historical accent that it wasn't a land that was completely taken over and would eventually have been talking Norman French. And William's home base remained Normandy. All those Norman supporters granted lands in England also still held estates across the Channel. William, in short, had an excess of riches, controlling them a headache. Here again, he showed great energy and wisdom. Et puis Guillaume a une qualité qu'il ne faut pas oublier, qui est très rare pour son époque. Il s'appuie sur les femmes et il va particulièrement s'appuyer sur la reine Mathilde, son épouse, qui aura la régence de la Normandie, par exemple, quand Guillaume sera en Angleterre. Et ça, c'est tout à fait extraordinaire. Ce, ce n'est pas du féminisme avant l'heure. C'est simplement la prise en compte du rôle de la femme dans une stratégie politique. In the church, of course, females had no roles of power. But here in Canterbury, as in York to the north, William introduced radical changes. He was determined to rid the church of any Anglo-Saxon influence and introduced the abbot of Beck, the great teacher Lanfranc, to be installed as archbishop.
the most powerful religious power in the country, was now in foreign hands. By 1096, there was not a single bishopric or abbot who was English. But some things did survive. Summer is a coming in. This is the oldest extant folk song in the English language. Folk song note, the language did come through. It was kept alive by the folk, the ordinary people who wielded no real power in their own country. They were the only people who now used it but it was a language on the verge of enormous changes under the influence of the new alien aristocracy, all of them French-speaking. There was more than Sumer coming in. It's thought that between 1066 and over the next two or three hundred years, between 10 and 12,000 French words came into the English language. Now you must look at a word hoard that English then had of between 25 and 30,000 words. So you're talking about half the equivalent of half a language being introduced, injected, forced on the people living here. And a lot of English words were lost. Not the bedrock. The great story about the English language is that the bedrock of the language, the old English, remains despite everything. And it still remains in global English today, despite everything. But nevertheless, it looked like a French takeover without any question whatsoever. Wherever you looked, French was taking over. There were words to do with the army. Army is a French word. Arch is a French word. Soldier is a French word. Garrison is a French word. They were to do with authority. Court is a French word. Nobility is a French word. Throne is a French word. Peasant is a French word. The feudal system came in. Everybody knew their place. Injustice, arrest is a French word. Jail, judge, jury, prison, they're all French words, wherever you look. Uh, and they were words that you had to know uh, because you were up against them, just like you were up against the great castles, you were up against the great cathedrals. The Normans brought all the words of authority and the way to run a state. England was now a totally subjected country. The invaders had achieved a conquest over the whole land and its institutions. But the alien king, William, was still only a duke in his homeland. The ultimate power in France was still vested in the king of France. The church solemnly acknowledged and supported the whole idea of kingship throughout Christendom. It was sacred, and all William's titles in Normandy, Count, Marquis, Duke, were delegated by a greater ruler, the King. The sacred line of French kings reminded everyone, William included, that there was a Kingdom of France of which Normandy was but a part. But what real power did this King now have? Son pouvoir est relativement réduit. Il ne gouverne véritablement que l'île de France. Il a une armée assez modeste. Et entre la Normandie et Paris, il y a juste une grande plaine. Et les Normands euh, peuvent à tout moment aller attaquer Paris. Euh, donc c'est tout à fait compliqué pour lui euh, de voir ce regroupement qui s'effectue entre la Normandie et l'Angleterre. King of England, Duke of Normandy. William was a regular cross-channel traveller holding firm control on both his vast estates. It was while punishing revolt on his Norman border that he was overcome with illness, caused by excessive eating of meat and fish. Taken to Rouen, it was clear that there would be no recovery. His corpulent body was stuffed into a sarcophagus in his monastery at Caen. It was a sordid affair. The sarcophagus was too small. The body burst open, filling the church with an awful stench. The funeral of the greatest king of his age 
ended in confusion and humiliation. In the centuries that followed, his grave was sacked several times. All that remains now is a simple marble slab. And under it, the only thing overlooked by the looters, a single thigh bone. <laughs>